We are now streaming live on Facebook. So says Zoom. Woo! All right. Good morning, everybody. It is Saga Saturday. Uh, and today we're talking about riddles, and I'm super excited because it doesn't take as much prep. Um, <laughs> yeah, super secret tip. We chose this this weekend, this today, because we've all been really slammed and riddles are easy. So uh, I am Ula Brenna's daughter, your self-professed Norse nerd, and I am joined here by two actual Norse nerds, or maybe they're just nerds. I don't know. Um, <laughs> let's start with Bercy's introduction because you weren't here last week. Yeah, um, I'm Bercy Edvartherson. Um, I have a degree in Old Norse, but not in Old English. And so I'm really excited to talk about Old English riddles and poems today. This is gonna be fun. Ooh, sort of, sort of getting my fingers over into the, the no. neighbors. Where are you putting your fingers the now, Bercy? The book. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so by the way, I'm just going to put this caveat out here that if there are small children watching, maybe this isn't the show for them. Uh, riddles, some of our riddles are a little um, adult in nature, we shall say. Uh, and because I'm involved, it's just kind of that show anyway. So, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Can I held. Uh, so I'm Dam Can I held. I don't actually have a degree in Old English, uh, but I do have a degree in linguistics. Um, and and in, in my degree, I specialized in the history of English um, and, and took some really phenomenal classes in Old English. Uh, and actually, I was really excited uh, because one of the articles that I've got that I read for today uh, was written by my Old English professor, uh, Professor Jonathan Wilcox out of the University of Iowa. And so uh, I, I found it and I was just like, uh, so the, the article uh, is Mock Riddles in Old English, Exeter Riddles 86 and 19, um, and it was published in the Studies in Philology, uh, Spring 1996. So we're going to talk about one of those two riddles uh, a little bit because it's actually my personal favorite riddle of all the riddles be for reasons that we will get into later. I believe that is one that I, uh, what did you say, 86? Yeah. Oh, I was thinking of 85. Well, anyway. so we'll talk about why, but the numbering yeah. of the riddles gets very confusing. It does. It's a little yeah. dicey. So it could be the same one that we're talking about. Yeah. Um, so uh, I guess let's start with, uh, well, one, I guess, Ula, if you would like to introduce, <laughs> you did your introduction. Okay. I'm away. I did mine. We're good. Let's roll. <laughs> let's roll. Uh, let's oh. do a little background really quickly. We've do some background on. The, yeah. We've talked about the Exeter book a couple of times. So you've all heard about it now. Um, but these these riddles that we're going to be talking about today are found in the Exeter book. They're found in two groups um, between folios 101 recto and uh, 115 recto uh, is group one. And then uh, the second is 122 verso to 130 verso, that's group two. So they're two, they're, they're separated by a bit. And in the middle, you've got some of the elegies that we've talked about previously. Um, and then, like I said, the numbering gets really confusing because as we've mentioned, the Exeter book riddle, the Exeter book in general does not present its poetry in a way that we today are used to looking at Old English poetry or any poetry. It's all just, it's like a paragraph, right? It just well, edge to edge in a block. And then there's usually, there's a, there's some punctuation at the very end of- If you're lucky. Poem, mostly. Um, and so the reason that the numbering gets weird is that nobody's entirely sure how many riddles there are. So the most common counts are uh, Crap and Dobby. Uh, they count 95 riddles and you'll see them listed as K hyphen R uh, mm -hmm. and then a number. And then the other one is Baum who counts 91 riddles. You've also got Craig Williamson who counts 91 riddles and numbers them. So Baum numbers his completely differently than Crap and Dobby. Yeah. Williamson does it similarly to Crap and Dobby um, but counts fewer riddles. Right. So, yeah. And that's, yeah, that was some, some interesting figuring out riddle numbers. Cause I was looking at several different things and I was looking at one that was the crap and Dobby and one that was the bomb. And I'm like, well, these don't line up like yeah. at all. Not like they're off by a couple, but like, I, I, we're talking Imperial and metric here. They just don't match. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, if I recall correctly, we've gone with Crap and Dobby numberings, which it makes me laugh every time I say his name. Like there's this- <laughs> Yeah, Crap. Crap, I'm I know. Sorry, sorry I'm 12. 
<laughs> yeah, no, so we, we count, I think most of our numberings through here are using the crap and Dobby numbering and I didn't include both numberings just because I didn't. So um, I didn't either. So the last, uh, last important thing to know is that answers aren't provided in the text. Um, they just provide the riddles. So that has been a place of much fruitful scholaring as, as, as <laughs> is that what we're calling it now? Fruitful scholaring? <laughs> fruitful scholaring. As later authors sit down and try and puzzle out what these different riddles mean. There's one riddle that may provide an answer, um, probably provides an answer, question mark, and we will actually talk about that riddle later because the answer is provided in runes. Yeah, so, so there were, there's another one that has the answer in runes as well. Yeah, so there's actually three runic riddles. Um, one of them, it gives a, a four, word, four letter answer that's not built into the poem and it's right. underneath it. So it's yeah. a one line poem and then there's four runes underneath that. And if you read the runes, uh, if you transliterate that, we'll, we'll talk about it. We'll, we'll yeah. talk about, yeah. So yeah, cause I found one that was a- But yeah, the-, the Five. This is very much a situation as if you got a package of popsicle sticks and like half the sticks were broken off and yep. just had a whole bunch of jokes. Yeah, but, oh, right, a whole bunch of jokes with no punchline. <laughs> <It's lines. laughs> I know what we got here. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it, it is really interesting to try to puzzle out what some of them are. Some of them, when I was personally reading them, I'm like, some of them I would read the the translator or the, you know, read the answer first, just to get an idea, right? And some of them I wouldn't. And I'm like, it doesn't necessarily matter if you read it first because it doesn't always help. Yeah, so we'll talk about uh, riddles as wisdom poetry, but one of the things is a lot of these are very obtuse. Like the answer is, is buried within layers of meaning. And there's a theory that the answers weren't provided because there's multiple answers to each of these, to many of these of riddles. Right? right. And so you're supposed to think about it. You're supposed to just kind of meditate on the riddle and like, yeah. where do I get with the answer? And there's, there's a great one that we'll talk about. That's the book moth or the bookworm, um, yeah. which has been presented as, as a bookworm uh, or maybe as a, a, a new scholar, a new, like a, in, in period, a, a new monk, maybe um, as yeah. they are beginning to go through the words and they are literally devouring these words. Devouring these um, words and, and learning from them but what do they do with that knowledge and right so there's there's a lot of this like metaphoric reading you have some literal meanings you have some metaphoric meanings anyway it's it's good stuff good stuff it is super good stuff so but riddles are not uh, uh riddles are not um specific sorry i lost my words uh to anglo-saxon like we know um there's riddles throughout time and we've talked about like Norse kennings before and, and sticking words together to make new words that are kind of riddles. You have to piece them out. Um, but what is, let's talk about some early riddles. So um, do you want to go into the Talmud since you've got that first? Yeah. So the, there's a great example. Um, so one of the Exeter riddles, uh, which is typically numbered Exeter riddle number 46, um, is, is, is actually considered one of the sexual riddles. And it finds a very close mirror in the Midrash uh, Micheli, which is, um, uh, oh, I'm gonna pronounce this wrong, Agatic Midrash to the book of Proverbs. So this, this particular example uh, that, that comes from the Talmud is, uh, says, then she, Sheba, questioned him, Solomon, Further, a woman said to her son, thy father is my father and thy grandfather, my husband, thou art my son and I am thy sister. Assuredly, said he, it was the husband, the daughter of Lot who thus spake to her son. So the, the, if you remember, if you, if you are familiar with the Bible and you think back to the story of Lot, right, they're escaping, uh, Lot, uh, his daughters are concerned that like there's no humans left on earth. So they get their father drunk one night and sleep with him and bear his children. So totally reasonable. Uh, yeah, no, like let's start off with a little incest, right? Um, so the, the, the argument here is that this riddle uh, preserved in the Talmud um, was probably a riddle that would have been known to Christian scholars. 
Um, and it's, it appears in the uh, Exeter book in 46, a man sat at wine with his two wives and his two sons and his two daughters, sweet sisters and their two sons, handsome firstborn ones. The daughter of each of the, or sorry, the father of each of these fine youths was in there too, uncle and nephew. In all, there were five men and women sitting inside. So it's not, obviously it's not the exact same language, but you've got a very similar kind of, you know, we're counting how many people there are um, and, and the interrelationship between them, which doesn't, if, if you had sort of a normal situation, it wouldn't count out to five people, right? Like you would, if, if you right. had a father, his daughters and sons and their, their, their children, right? Like you would assume more than five. Um, so that's, that's one of the examples that was identified as an, an probably a predecessor to this, this example. Um, looking back further in history, uh, just sort of at the riddling tradition, we've got one of my very favorite riddles that I, I learned about today, uh, learned about this week. Um, it was written, I, and if, you, if anybody out there was on the um, uh, post between two peers discord last night, you would have heard me tell this riddle. Uh, it is by a gentleman, a Greek man named Eugilus, uh, who's fourth uh, century BCE, and it survived in a second, or sorry, third century book, um, the tenth book of which I'm not going to try and pronounce the Greek. If anybody else wants to try, where, where is uh, this the day the one that starts with the D? Yeah, Deipnosophistai. Okay, good job. Uh, so it's the translation is sophists at dinner. And it's, it's this whole, like it's 10, this is book 10 of this, this collection. Um, and they go through discussions of politics and wine and music and all this kind of stuff. And eventually they get to riddles. They're telling each other these riddles and they, they remember this one, Uvulus, fourth century. And the riddle goes like this. It has no tongue, yet it talks. Its name is the same for male or female, steward of its own winds, hairy or sometimes hairless, saying things unintelligible to them that understand, drawing out one melody after another. One thing it is, yet many, and if one wound it, it is unwound. Anybody want to? I have to read them. I'm terrible about parsing these. Uh... So just think, the, like these the are- The interesting part for me is uh, linguistically the second clue, its name is the same for f male or female. Cause that's something I'm like, yep. well, it sounds like I'm not going to be using that clue. I have a yeah. feeling that has to do with gendered language that, or is it, or is it actually a helpful clue? It, it, it could be understood as a helpful clue if you think about kind of Greek cultural history, early, mm -hmm. early ancient Greek cultural history. Something I'm an expert in, yes. Right. The <laughs> only thing I can think of is like a lyre or some other stringed instrument. Okay. Uh, yeah, so, so I was also thinking like some kind of instrument. I mean, like it has one melody drawn out after another specifically said. So I was like, uh, a group of instruments. It's a butt. Oh, uh, well, there you have it. Even better, an instrument. It is. <laughs> well, there you go. So I, I included this talk because I wanted. Oh to my goodness! Talk about right out with the butt jokes. There we go. We're just going right in here, people. <laughs> uh, so that you heard of its own winds. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. Yep. Yep. That's awesome. Hairy <laughs> or sometimes hairless, saying things unintelligible. unintelligible. To them that understand, drawing out one melody after another, one thing it is, yet met, and if woo. Yeah, yep. it's, it's one, but it's got two cheeks. Yep, yep, yep. yep. Indeed, all righty then. Yeah, so that's that's the whole point of this Greek riddle section. If you're wondering why there's like this, this sidetrack into Greek riddles, it's because I wanted to tell that particular It's joke. because you wanted to put in a butt joke. <laughs> I did. Yep. I really all right, did. Okay. wow. So, and, and you know what, just last week, someone, uh, I uh, commented uh, that our show was erudite and I don't know that we're going there right now. <laughs> we're here to bring that down, back <laughs> down to earth. 
<laughs> oh my goodness all righty then it's always butts um okay uh so so bringing it though a little closer to the exeter book and and maybe actually some actual history uh we, well i mean frankly fourth century butt jokes are actual history they are um, but bringing it in uh we've got these late roman enigmas um there's uh, one of uh, Riddle 86 actually is an example of one of these late Roman enigmas uh, that's been translated into Old English. Um, and then we start to see in the eighth century, these uh, Anglo-Latin collections of, of, of enigmas or enigmata is another term you'll see, um, but they're riddle collections. And actually this morning, like literally as we were sitting down to do this 945, I get the text message that a book has been delivered and it's, it's my copy of one of these riddle collections and I'm really excited to get into it. Um, uh, so this is Aldhelm. Aldhelm uh, uh, roughly about 705. Uh, this was part of, it was called De Metris and it was part of Epistola ad Acricium. Um, yeah. So it's, it, it's made up of a hundred riddles and these are mostly sort of more serious riddles like there's there's definitely some unserious riddles in here there always is but it's it's sort of an encyclopedic collection right like it's we've got the cosmos and we go through different animals and we kind of go through life and it's 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 a much it's it's a little bit more high-minded than the butt riddle sort of kind of a little bit um more like our last episode <laughs> <laughs> Um, but this is this is the first of them. This is 705. About 731, there's a new another one uh, by a gentleman named Tatwine, and that's called Tatwine's Enigmata. It survives in the British Library and the Cambridge Library. Both of these are early 11th century manuscripts, and there's 40 riddles largely based on Aldhelm's riddles. So it's it's kind of a retelling of Aldhelm's riddles. And then, so Althelm had 100. 100 seems like a good number for a riddle collection. So we have this next guy come along, Eusebius, uh, who may, Eusebius may have been sort of a pen name for a guy named Hwatbert, which if I ever like register a male name, Hwatbert may be it. Like, so that I can walk into what? Um, anyway, uh, <laughs> thank you. That's that's my outstanding joke. So uh, it may have been <laughs> He born, or he he came uh, he became abbot around 716 and died in the 740s. So that that provides some bounds for when he wrote his riddles. And he writ, wrote he writ he wrote uh, an additional 60 riddles that were probably intended to supplement Tatwines. So uh, these the Eusebius's enigmata survived collected with Tatwines. So you have Tatwines 40 and then Eusebius's 60. Um, You're hundred. Exactly, meeting up with that that hundred initially set out by Althelm, um, and what's interesting is is the way that his are organized. So Althelms are kind of organized in these coherent groups, Tatwines a little bit, but then we get into uh, Eusebius's, and the organization seems a little weird when you're looking at it, but once you start kind of digging into it, it starts to make a little more sense. So there's there's two of them specifically that sort of show this right one of them is enigma 39 the answer to which is the letter i and then the real following that is riddle 40 the answer to which is fish and that may seem weird like the letter i in a fish but if you think about this abbot right christian very very christian person very sort of learned in christian tradition if you think about christian tradition right well we talk about the jesus fish a lot that that line art fish symbol Yep. So the reason that that line art fish symbol is a symbol for Jesus is there is a Greek uh, acronym, I think, uh, sort of, yeah, acronym uh, yeah. that's ichthos, ichthos. Uh, which translates which is- as, as something about Jesus. I don't, I have it in my notes somewhere and I, I don't actually remember what it was. And then the letter I is uh, I-N-R-I, Jesus of Nazareth, uh, King of the Jews or King of Israel, kind of depending on, on who's doing the translating. Um, I bet you it's in this one. I think this is the one with the representation of a fish. There it is. Um, Jesus Nazarenos Rex uh, Judeorum. Judeorum. So that's that's Jesus uh, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And then uh, Ichthos, I can't read the Greek, but it translates as Jesus Christ, God's Son, Savior. Yeah, so, I, I've got I've got it written down somewhere else in Greek. So the Jesus Christos 
Theo Hisos Sotan. Okay. And it, it, yeah. But the I'll first, buy it. There it is. Yeah. The first yeah. letter of each of those words spells out ichthos, which means. Yeah. So, so that's that's where the connection is sort of drawn between those two riddles. And then you start to look deeper into the meaning of the riddles and you start to be able to pick out these patterns. Um, so those are the, that's that's what's called the Anglo-Latin written riddle tradition. Um, and it, it does seem kind of, when we think about sort of a broader Germanic tradition, it's like, okay, these are really, this is a weird way for the early medieval English to express this, but you figure they were Christianized much earlier than um, Scandinavia was. Yep. So they adopt this. And so they express this battle of wits slightly differently than you might see in Scandinavia, um, which uh, Bercy, I'm going to leave it to you to talk about battles of wits in Scandinavia because yes. that's your thing. Because that's, yeah, that's your thing. Yeah. Um... So battles of wits happen fairly, you know, they come up uh, in literature and also like in history um, and in myth. Um, and these different battles of wits, they can also sort of be sort of tied up with um, just general kind of like task type battles. Kind of, um, if you think of the um, Utgar the Loki story where uh, Thor goes out, this is, Uthgar the Loki, not Loki. So we're talking about a giant um, who just happens to have a similar name to Loki, um, uh, who challenges Thor to do a whole bunch of impossible tasks. This is like the uh, eating as fast as fire, drinking from the horn that's got the ocean in it, um, running against, what was it, wind or time or something, someone you could never catch, old age or something yeah, like that. Yeah, I think he has to wrestle old age maybe. Or I thought it was it was a race and it's like a foot, a foot race, right? A foot race. A foot race. I thought it was foot race against like the can't win, but up, right, you know. But he like ties anyway. Yeah. So we've got this idea of you know proving yourself, and this you know we can relate that to gender too. But like proving yourself, and one of the ways you can prove yourself, and that keeps coming up in things, are you know oftentimes it's a king or it's just straight up Odin pretending to be a king in the case of um, uh, 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 the conversation in um, with Gangleri in um, Gilfagine, or not Gangleri, rather, in, um, yeah, that's what he, that's what he goes by, in Gilfagine, or Gilfi, whatever, they've, the names are getting a little bit <laughs> this morning, but uh, in Gilfagine, we've got um, uh, Gilfi talking to High just as high and third who are all sort of Odin at the same time. And they, um, it, it's a question and answer, sort of a back and forth. Tell me if you know all these things. And, um, or for instance, the, the, uh, in um, the conversation with Odin and the Volva in Voluspau, which tells the, you know, and she keeps asking him, have I told you enough yet? Have I proven that I know enough yet at this point, right? And um, uh, we talked about Hervaro Saga um, last month, and we looked at the riddles there. And some of those riddles were interesting things um, that I, that I, this was the one that I really um, felt like they had a lot of similarities to um, the riddles that we read for, for today, the Exeter book ones. Cause um, for instance, like, the, the riddle where the answer was like um, a dead a snake on top of a dead horse on an ice flow. Like, like wildly specific, yeah. ridiculous. Like, I think that's like the mock riddles, right? Like very highly specific things. But um, what I know sort of most about is is really the kennings bit i haven't um actually delved too far into like riddles specifically in old norse um sources because for the most part you end up encountering them as just sort of poems um because a lot of poetry just sort of takes a form that you might be able to call a riddle because you have to decipher the poem um just to figure out what on earth is being talked about um and because uh the main sort of unit of 
of poetry in Old Norse is the Kenning. Um, and uh, Kenning's, which we've discussed before, just very in brief for Old Norse, Kenning's are um, sort of complex metaphors. They're similar to metaphors where you uh, are referring to something um, by talking about something else and you use a uh, usually takes the format of there's a base word that like is the stand-in for the actual thing you're talking about usually a noun and then there's some determinant that modifies the word and makes it into uh, a new a new thing yeah can I help what you so say? The, so the one that I will never forget at this point is tungle ru rondum tungla yeah <laughs> which, <laughs> which we spent hours it took about three hours to translate this one word, so <laughs> which was just one kenning, um, but it was like a multi. You can you can wreck it. You can you can chain together um, multiple kennings, and so essentially, like a very basic kenning would be. Um, and I always use this example: ship of the desert in English. The ship of the desert. Ship is our base word. It's standing in for something, and of the desert is the determinant. It is modifying the ship to tell you exactly where that ship is. Now, of course, a ship on a desert, that's not going to work out too well. Um, well, what carries cargo and travels far distances across a desert? A camel. camel. So the ship of a desert, the ship is referring to a camel. And so that, that tongue, I can't even remember the word. I love that you've remembered. I know, the fact that you just rattled that off. No, I it's because we, I had to practice that word so many times so I can say tungle rurondum tungla without yes. throwing it up. But now it's, it's I, I have an SCA friend whose SCA name is Sebastian Angafangilovich Goljetsen. And the reason that I can just spit that out is because I stood in front of a mirror for like an hour and a half, just saying it over and over again so that when I called him into court as a herald, I would not butcher his name. And like I work as a small community, so you just eventually memorize these names that are, are right. Th that makes sense. I mean, I, I would have just called him the Russian, but you know. <laughs> uh, but no, Tungla Rurundum Tungla was like the, the it, it had to do with the moon of, it was yes. like the moon Thing. destroyer so just dis it was destroyer of the uh moons of the bowsprit right and so the and so destroyer is our base word right so it's 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 the thing that we're talking about is whatever is destroying the moons of the bowsprit let's go forward what are the moons of the bowsprit well the bowsprit is actually a Haiti, which is similar to a Kenning, but a Haiti is just one word that's sort of replacing another thing. So bowsprit, usually usually Haiti, one of the major forms Haiti take is like referring to a whole thing by just talking about one part of it. And mm -hmm. so by saying just the bowsprit, you were talking about a whole ship. You can say a main and be talking about an entire horse. There's um, a, sorry, there's an English, there's a word in, 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 in like English class that has that same meaning, Haiti. And it, it's when you talk about an element of something. So when you talk about like um, the head of the nation, like, yeah, anyway, go ahead. Sorry, I'm gonna, there's a word. And it's gonna... Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you so... people in your words. <laughs> And so the uh, the bowsprit here, of course, we're talking about the entire ship. So the moons of a ship, what are the moon? Well, moons are round. <laughs> A moon is a round thing, and a round thing on a ship is a shield. are the shields that line the edge of a, sh of a you know, a typical yep. Viking boat. Um, and so you've got your shields on the longship, and the destroyer of shields is a warrior. It's so warrior. the destroyer of the moons of the bowsprit is, the, is a warrior. Um, and so as you can see, like, and that's just... And that was just one, one, two words, really. It was tung, tungul riorundum tungla, right? Yeah. Okay, Tough so like <laughs> two words to mean warrior, but that have like so many different- There's parts. so much packed and, into that little, you know, bit. And as we saw in that particular verse that we were trying to translate this from, like that was, it, it was, uh, 
mixed up. The word order can be very mixed up because of the way Old Norse is structured as a language. And so like you can tell what's happening grammatically in a sentence fairly easily just from the forms that words take. So you can mix up word order. It's uh, not nearly as bad as Latin poetry, where oftentimes you're looking down 30 lines looking for your verb. Um, <laughs> at least they'll there, there's a there's reason Latin is a verb dead in language. Those four lines. They <laughs> <laughs> gonna be somewhere in there um but like i i used to talk about um uh i used to i just uh, anyway uh the when i did poetry translation as opposed to like uh old norse like prose translations i could uh depending on the difficulty of the actual text some people write better than others and some people write with more like flowery vocabulary so it's harder to translate but an average amount of text I could probably translate three pages in in three hours um uh fat more now I think but at the time and then uh I sat down to translate one eight line stanza <laughs> And it took me three hours to translate one eight line stanza, right? Six syllables per line, you guys. And <laughs> it's sort of like your step one is flipping all of your puzzle pieces over. And that's just doing the, the brute translating of right. every single word and writing out exactly all of the different grammatical things it could be doing. Because oftentimes right. the forms match up with other things this could be a verb in the first present or it could actually be a noun total different word um and so like just try to figure that out and then you now you have your puzzle pieces flipped over you still have to put it together right? and then once you put it together you're looking at an image that is in code it's it's got kennings in it and so now you're like you have to step back and try to focus your eyes on the image and figure out what it actually means and so poetry in and of itself often takes a form that just is a riddle um it took in one particular saga in Gisli's saga um uh Gisli murders several people um and of course this is not killing this is a murder he doesn't tell people about it and what's worse they're his relatives it's like his his uh brother-in-law he's getting outlawed uh, ooh, ooh, ooh. and he does he gets outlawed he survives he's the second longest surviving outlaw but he um he actually at two different funerals for people that he murdered he he sort of gives as part of like he gives the gift of a verse at the funeral and everyone's like this is me oh that was very good oh so nice that was oh, so lovely cool. yeah how lovely i mean it's really sad because these are his family members that have died um and it took his sister it took it takes his sister three weeks to decipher one of his poems and comes up to him three weeks later and goes you murdered him. Yeah, it was what it was his admission his of murder. admission of guilt done in this <laughs> poetic kenning that nobody. Yeah, yeah, that was that was ballsy, is what that was. And the the one last little piece of evidence I wanted to include on the Norse thing uh, um, is just uh, a the Lilia poem that we taught Lilia that we. Uh, come across it's a much later poem and it's um when Drokvait sort of goes out of fashion um as the major poetic form for Old Norse and Hrinhent which had existed um is it's sort of just a modified Drokvait's form Hrinhent was coming into the fore and um uh the Lilia author um who was clearly very virtuosa uh has a whole section right at the end of the Lily of Lilia where he talks about like I have written this poem to show that you can write beautiful poetry that is understandable like I think that like in the past we have yeah. done so much of making things hard to understand but, and not yeah. and not like easy to read and listen to it is such a great dig on <laughs> previous you know previous writers it really yeah it's like we don't have to make everything a riddle and he takes the super like humble brag tone he's like 
One might say that I was just a lowly poet who did not write well, and I'm, I'm, I, you know, I can't possibly live up to the glory of God. It's about Jesus, the poem. I, you know, I can't possibly live up to the glory of God to like write this poem as well as it should, but at least it's understandable. Unlike those guys in the past who keep like making those things, guys, yeah, <laughs> um, making things riddle like. Um, so. That's my bit about Old Norse poetry and their riddle-like qualities. <laughs> so really quickly, uh, the word that I was trying to remember is synodoka or synodok, Syn something like that. Anyway, it's a Greek word. It doesn't get used very often. It really like shows up in, in English class and that's it. Um, and it's, it's when you refer to a whole thing by a part of the thing. Uh, so uh, like, the hand that rocks the cradle, right? You're referring mm. to the hand, but you're really referring to like this this larger thing. Because uh, unless you're talking about thing from the Adams family, there is more right. than just the hand. Right. Yeah. You so, S Y N C E O C E, I think. Oh, oh. There might be an extra C in there. Yeah, there is. S Y N E C D O C H E. Oh, Synecdoche, I think. Synecdoche. And that in upstate New York? Yeah, yeah. Look, no. Yeah, Synecdoche. Synecdoche. A I've figure been... of speech in which a part is made to represent the whole or vice versa. Cool. Yeah, <laughs> so long story short, I've been saying Synecdoche wrong my entire life. I have been saying Synodoc <laughs> for so long. <laughs> And this is what happens when you see a word in writing and you right? never hear it. Right? Well, so my job this week is to use synecdoche, synecdoche in a it, sentence five times so I never say synodoc again. <laughs> I'm just going to say synecdoche because that's, you know, because I am not uh, educated like you people. <laughs> oh my God, you're Listen, killing me. I must have read it somewhere and then right. like, which it's sort of like gun whales. The amount of time I spent in my life talking about gun whales, including oh, higher uh, it's gunwall. Yeah, it's gunnel. Uh, gunnels. Who didn't know gunnels, right? Yeah. Um, an entire presentation uh, in front of a, a university class where I'm blah, 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 gun whales, gun whales, gun whales, gun whales. And finally the professor was like, do you mean gunnels? And I was like, I do, thank you. Moving uh, on. Ouch. Oh, <laughs> yeah. um, so uh, that was not very wise of me, uh, that mistake. But um, what is wise is is wisdom poetry in Old English, which we've talked about. We actually did a whole episode. Perfect segue, this. my goodness. I couldn't, I was just going to throw it to you, but look at that. Um, so we did a whole section on wisdom poetry, gnomic poetry. There was a gnome hat I should have brought along with oh, me. Oh, the gnome hat. hat. I love the gnome hat. The gnome hat. It, I still, it makes me happy. I look forward to being able to wear it to an event someday. Um, so there is a, a sort of this history of gnomic verse in Old English. Um, you've got Solomon and Saturn. Saturn, you've got um, Maxims 1 and 2, uh, the fate of men, the fate of the world, I think is one. Um, they are all, though, characterized by being largely sort of didactic in form and directed at the presentation of both sort of general truths and philosophical or esoteric insights into the nature of things and concepts. Um, so it's, you've got these sort of, you know, you're laying out a little bit of basic truth and then you're sort of digging into these greater ideas. A great example of that is Solomon and Saturn, uh, which is a conversation between Solomon, um, biblical Solomon, and Saturn, who is here understood as a prince of a far-off land rather than uh, a Roman god, um, because we can't uh, have other gods. We just, they, we- It's been euhemerized. Right. I was going to say there was a word that we learned that I've forgotten and, and you got me. Um, so he, uh, you know, like this whole, tr we've got, we've talked about previously, this whole tradition of basically taking um, previously divine figures and, and you hemorrhizing them into sort of pseudo historical figures. And that's, that's kind of what's happened with Solomon or sorry, Saturn here. Mm -hmm. 
So in the conversation between the poem, or between the two of them, which is the form this poem takes, um, there's a, one line which says, but what is, one, what is that wonder that through this world travels, inexorably goes, beats at foundations, awaken tear, awakens tears of lamentation, often attacks here. And so this is a little bit of that riddling back and forward. And I don't actually know what the answer to that poem is, or answer to that kind of riddle is, which is unfortunate. Um, but it's it's that like you're you're digging both at like obviously there's an answer to this, right? Like what what is it that does this? But within describing it, you're using these sort of broader, you know, it it oh it's um transience is the answer, right? And and that's but that's like Fairly. That's a deep answer, right? It's it's uh, you know it, it foundations crumble and they pass away. Like like we're talking about entropy here, and this is a yeah. this is a much bigger answer than than butts. Um, <laughs> though one could argue that butts is a deeply philosophical answer. Like but, we, I believe we've had those conversations before. <laughs> <laughs> like butts are necessary to to philosophy. Let's please not confuse ourselves yeah. on that one. But like Absolutely. like you're having these these sort of high level conversations and the answer to the riddle is transience, right? Um, so within this, this sort of idea of riddles as having this, this more elevated discourse, right? We have riddle 43, which uh, is identified as uh, most clearly corresponding with this sort of wisdom poetry motif, maybe not overtly, but uh, sort of, not, if not overt, then subvert. Um, and sort of the theme that it examines, the concise illustration of the motif uh, that, that also appears in the poem, Soul and Body. So let me find 43. I ended up, like, half of these, I copied the poem out and half of them I didn't. I've got, I've got it, 43. Uh, is it 43 from, I oh, want, mm. uh, Is it, I know of a lofty stranger? I know of a lofty stranger? Yeah. Okay, got I've point. got it right here, I'll just read it. Uh, I know of a lofty stranger in the yards beloved by noblemen, whom sharp hunger cannot harm, nor hot thirst, old age, or sickness. If the servant serves him kindly, who must go away on that journey? They will find at home certain and unharmed happiness and a hot meal, countless children. By sorrow, if the servants obey his lord poorly, his master along their way, brother does not fear brother who injures them both. When they both depart, eager for yonder, from the lap of a single kinsman, mother and sister. Let the one who wishes to name this stranger in familiar words, or else the servant. Who am I talking about here? Uh, okay, so we've got. <laughs> so <laughs> that the man we are trying to find out either the stranger or the stranger's servants, right? Yeah. And we've been, okay, lofty stranger, loved by noblemen. Can't it can't be hungry? Yep. Nor thirsty nor old, doesn't get old or sick, right? Um, if the servant serves him kindly, who must go away on that journey? Where he will find uh, feasting and bliss. So when he, right. when, when, when he goes away on his journey, he will ultimately find, uh, find joy, find his family. Hot meal, hot children. Hot meal, safety at the road's end. But, but sorrow if... if the if servant obeys poorly. Brother does not fear brother who injures them both. What? This is gonna be. So it, it's it's one of these sort of esoteric ones, right? Mm -hmm. So the 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 stranger is the soul, and the servant is the body. So if, if somebody treats their soul well, if they go to church, if they do good deeds, all this kind of stuff, their reward in the afterlife is joy and bliss and feasting and family, which, which has sort of like this whole, like you go to this great feast hall in the sky moment where you're like, do you mean Valhalla? Like, <laughs> like, like I've never, I, I, in, in, in Christian texts, I don't really remember a lot of feasting and, and joy, bliss. Yes. But like. Party with the fam? That's not typically addressed in sort of. <laughs> well, but you gotta remember, we're we're blending the old with the new here. It's right. that, uh, yeah. Um, but if if you if you treat your soul poorly, if you don't uh, live this good Christian life, the only reward that you receive at the end is sorrow, right? Yeah. It's you, you'll go to hell. There's no party there. I mean, 
all the good musicians go to hell, they tell me. So presumably the medic music there is better. Otherwise it's just hymns. Um, but if you want the rock and roll, I guess they you didn't. Or I'm headed. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't know rock and roll in the early medieval right. period. Um, so that's, that's that kind of wisdom poetry type riddle, right? Where you've got this, this language that really kind of makes you think about things, has a very sort of homiletic theme um, and, and is very just sort of like feel the feeling. The other really great one is 47. Um, and we talked about this one a little bit at the beginning. Uh, do you want to read it or would you like me to? Uh, if you've got it up, go ahead. Uh, a moth ate words, a marvel to me, when I found out their strange fate, that the worm swallowed some man's song, a thief in the night filched his fine speech and its stout structure. The stealing guest was not a whit the wiser for the words he guzzled. Mm -hmm. Right, so that, that often gets translated as bookworm, right? Literally the worm eating through the books and, and it's none the wiser for the words that it consumes. Um, but another translation that's been proposed is like a novice, um, somebody new to a monastery. They're, they're not really getting anything yet. They haven't yeah. taken the time to become wise so that, that when they read these words that they get something from them. They're just chewing. They're just, they're, they're just yeah, like and absorbing, maybe. but not recognize, not. Right. Yeah. They're, they're the kind of fan who can name any trivia fact from something, but cannot do any in-depth analysis of plot or, or character development at all. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. All breadth, no depth. Exactly. Exactly. Um, um, so I, I just wanted to, I just thought, I, I hope this isn't too preemptive, but I, after reading 43 and then my eyes tracked down to 44 and it looked almost like it was going to be a very raunchy poem. <laughs> <laughs> so I think oh, I think it's supposed to make that's, that's one that I have on my list. Yep. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, we will, we will belt, but it seems like it's not gonna be belt. I'll tell you, like a yeah, yeah. This is and that's that's what's great about this collection <laughs> is that you go from I know a noble, precious guest in human dwelling whom grim hunger cannot harm nor hot thirst. Blah 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 blah. Right to strangely hangs by a man's thigh below his lap in front of his hole. <laughs> it's a hole. His stiff and hard stands in good stead when a man his own skirt hoists over his knee, wants that known hole with his dangler's head to greet, fill it as he filled it long and oft before, right? Like, <laughs> which, which at first I was like, no, no. <laughs> but I, I do think this is referring to a belt and yes. not and not so I think something that else one, that might hang out a man's belt. <laughs> so I think that one often gets either belt or a key. Key is yeah. a, yeah. 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 Once that known hole, the, the lock. Yeah. Right. Well, but that's also the, 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 the tongue of the buckle going through yeah. the hole, right? Yeah. So exactly. I like, I, yeah, I could see belt. Absolutely. And it's so, so yeah, we, we have jumped ahead a little bit, but that Sorry, is, yeah, I just, we have, it's, but it's okay. Whatever. But that's, that's what's so great about this collection is you go from deep to not so how deep. many times can I make my eyebrows do the eyebrow thing? Um, and then it rolls into that for a few, like there's a couple of those ones. And then from, so 43 is, is sort of this deep one. 44 is one of the, the raunchy ones. 45 is a slightly raunchy one. 46 is the incest one. And then 47 is the, the, the bookworm. The bookworm. Right back into like, yep. it's, this is, this is like when you put some of my playlists on Spotify on yeah. shuffle. Oh, just this is yeah, absolutely. This is a playlist on shuffle. It's just going from Johnny Cash to the Beastie Boys to I, I don't even to Pink. I don't even know. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's uh, let's move on to um, yeah. to the next section, which I've, I'm talking about it here as a, uh, Riddle eighty six, um, and that says eighty eight on the top. So Riddle eighty six. Love uh, this one. Yeah, this is this 86 is my absolute favorite riddle. It is 
so fucking ridiculous and I love it. So I will read it to you in Old English uh, and then I'll read it to you in English. You can take a stab. Most, I think both of you probably know the answer because I think I've told it to you already, but you know, uh, take a stab at it and then we can talk a little bit about, uh, about why it's so interesting. So in Old English, Whitcomb Gongan Tharwer Satan, Moniga on Mave, Mave, Modus Notera, Havda an Eaga, on Eren Twa, on Twa Fet, Twelf Hund Hefda, Ruch on Womba, on Honda Twa, Ermas on Exla, Anna Sweoran, on Sindan Twa, Saga Huat Ich Hata. So in translation, a creature walked among wise men, sitting in a crowded assembly. It had one eye and two ears and two feet and 1,200 heads, back and belly, and two hands, arms, shoulders, one neck, and two sides. Say what I am called. I know this one, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, I just can't remember exactly. Like, it's like. It's a one-eyed garlic cellar, of course. Right, one eye, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a cellar full of garlic. It's got 12. 100. It's a guy going around selling garlic. He's selling garlic. Oh, He's yeah. only got one eye. And a cart yeah. full of garlic. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's just, it is, it is a deeply ridiculous poem, right? Like there is, there is nothing sober minded about this. And uh, uh, so what's first off, what's kind of cool about this is it's actually a retelling of one from a fourth or fifth century collection of Latin riddles um, by a gentleman named Symphosius. Symphosius is Enigma. Um, so the version in Latin uh, goes, emere um, fas et quod, I don't remember the name, the word for 12 or whatever number that is, V-I-X, maybe that's just a word. Emere iam fas est quod fix tibi credere fas est, unus inest oculus, Capitum sed milia multa, qui quod habit winedit, uh, windit, quod non habit unde parabit. So, uh, just like that. Right. Um, so in English, now you might see what you have, might, what now you might, now might you see what you might scarce, scarcely believe. He has one eye, but, a, but thou, many thousands of heads. From where he will, from where will he who sells what he has procure what he has not the ground right like it's a, it's a weird question but the answer is a one-eyed seller of garlic yeah. <laughs> uh, so so obviously there's there's parts of this story that don't survive in the old english version the old english version does not identify him um as a seller of anything he just sort of attends this this group of of wise men um and then it goes much more into sort of the counting of things. So it, it gets it gets you sort of folk like it gets feet, focused on the numbers, right, right? Right. So one eye, two feet, a back and a belly, two hands, two arms, two shoulders, one neck, two sides. Right. Like we're counting. And mm -hmm. and so um, uh, Professor Wilcox connects us with the St. Ives riddle and says these are both examples of what are called a mock riddle, where there's the answer is is supposed to just. Right. Right. Um, and what's I, else? it's a dad. It's the dad joke of riddles. Exactly. Right. I'm thinking of um, like like one that's coming to mind is just like uh, you know it has it has no brain um, and it makes the sound of uh, thump 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 squish. Uh, I think I got that wrong. Actually, I didn't. Don't think I had enough thumps, but um uh you know like oh what is it right and it's uh in an octopus wearing uh missing one boot um <laughs> they, uh, like yeah <laughs> what, that's what a has, dad joke <laughs> what has four wheels and flies a dump truck <laughs> So, so kind of the what connects both um, this riddle and the St. Ives riddle. St. Ives riddle is, I, uh, as I was going to St. Ives, I saw a man with seven wives. Seven wives had seven sacks. Seven sacks had seven cats. Seven cats had seven kits. Kits, cats, sacks, wives. How many were going to St. Ives? 
it's one. I was going to St. Ives. Right. And you, you're, and you you're saw supposed to get that, distracted yeah. by all this counting, right? Yeah, so yeah. the same thing kind of happens here. You're supposed to get distracted by the counting. And there's also kind of a mismatch uh, where it's a weird creature and then say what I am, right? So you, you wouldn't say I, you wouldn't start with a weird creature. So describe me, right? right. Um, so it's, it's supposed to have this kind of mismatch and it doesn't quite work. But then the answer is, ha ha, it's a one-eyed seller of garlic obviously right. or or a one-eyed seller of onions is another because exactly. uh, mm -hmm. right heads yeah um I'm which sure. i went on this whole thing last night about allium um and and the role that that members of the allium family so leeks uh, onions and garlic, garlic play in germanic mythology which is it's so kind of ridiculous actually it is like the number of leeks and yeah it's, yeah, it's it, like this whole moment, and and there's a there's a, a series of uh, th so there's a runic charm from Proto Germanic uh, that's a, a L U, and it so it reads alu, alu which is I, ale, right? Everywhere, yeah, right. Uh, but then you have um, a I don't remember the a one. L is uh, lagas, and it, so it could be like leek or water, and then the u is ur uh, or urus, which is uh, cattle. Yeah, so or, somehow it works out to like water leaks and cattle are the basically like the things you need to survive and beer and beer yeah I, i'm saying that sounds like a really yummy stew to me but right <laughs> um, but it shows up in all these weird places and there's there's a number of brachiates which are these beautiful golden ornaments that have sort of line art uh warriors on them typically and then it'll have alu written on on a part of it as like a charm and it's this this whole little moment but Leaks, man, they're magic. Leaks are uh, the A rune, just in case anyone was wondering, um, is Ansus, and it um, seems to be the name is based on a Proto Germanic uh, deity. Okay. So, um, and so it's vaguely like sort of a uh, god, or I think it's related to the fact that Asir is like okay. that. Um, right. And, and, uh, oh, yeah. Uh, in the Gothic al alphabet, it's actually called Aza. Um, but the, uh, so I lost track of what I was saying. Continue, sorry. Right, that's okay. Well, actually runes <laughs> is a great clef moment because that's the next section of my notes. It, so it I, is. So I'm, there's what, six of them that have include runes? So I found three, there might be some more. Um, okay. but I, I, this was literally like me last night with, this is the book I've been working from. Right. It's, it's Porter's Anglo-Saxon riddles. Um, so I found three of them flipping through here pretty quickly. I'm going to share my screen. Um, yeah, six of them with runes. So that you guys, that we, it's a lot easier to kind of understand uh, these, yeah. these particular riddles and what's neat about them um, if, if you can see them. So really fast before we get into these riddles, I wanted to mention, I remembered what I was going to say. I wanted to mention that um, in addition to alu being found on like a billion different like coins and other like pieces of art and things as as Knild was saying, um, another one that you often find places, not nearly as often as alu, is just the first three letters of the uh, runic alphabet. So um, just F, the U, and the the th or rune so, so the thorn so it's a uh, foot right uh, foot of foot arc um and it's great because either they're writing just like abc or you know some sort of like again talking about what the the names of the runes and sort of using them as a as an invocation uh but it also um foot is the uh a way to refer to uh, women's genitalia uh, in Old Norse. Um, so I just find it interesting that Futh and Alu, Ale and uh, are the ones that come up <laughs> in so much Viking uh, art and yep. objects. So thank you for continuing to talk. I'm watching our live stream and it looks like it's decided that what it really wants to show off is my notes. So no, we're, we're back. It's back to the slide. Is it? Yep. Yeah. Because now I'm looking at just the three of us. Just the three of us. Okay, there we go. Slides. Brilliant. Okay, yeah, um, we have slides. Okay, so the first one that I've got is riddles. I think it's riddle 75. I've cut that part of my notes off. 
Um, yep. And this is one okay. where there is a, a sort of a, a debate about is this one, is 75 a riddle alone or is 75 a riddle with 76? Um, so in Old English, if, uh, sorry, itch swift na yaseach on swaf, on swaf uh, And then the runes, uh, you would read them as um, D N U H. So uh, in English, I saw Fleetfoot on the trail, and then uh, the uh, dog, nude, ur, and hagel. Um, and so initially, you might try and read into that. Wow, there's a lot of extra parentheses there. Um, you might try and read, like, do, do these together mean something? So we've got day and need and arach and hail. What are we? No, read them backwards H U N D. It's dog. So so, and that's what I found. So I, I just double checked. There are six with runes in okay. according to several people. Um, and several of them, you have to read the runes backwards. There's another one that has horse. Well, sh 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 oh, sorry, <laughs> we're getting there. <laughs> all right. Well, I've got three of them pulled out uh, instead of all six. So I guess uh, folks at home will have to go look them up for themselves. Um, but so I saw Fleetfoot on the trail, Fleetfoot here, the answer is the dog. Um, and then the riddle 76 is uh, which is I saw a woman sit alone. And so some people have read these two together. So I saw Fleetfoot on the trail, uh, uh, a dog need or hagel, I saw a woman, or a woman sitting alone. Um, one particularly interesting translation of the two of these together is urine. Um, and the way that the author, the way that the, the, this particular interpreter got there was that you have, so men, when they pee, they can pee on the trail. They can like, like they, as they're standing, they can pee. Lucky Women bastards. You have to sort of sit alone. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's how they got to that translation. That's one of those ones where I'm like, huh. Well, that is a way to look at it. Have to do with it. Where does so, the dog come in? If, if well, dogs pee standing up like guys, well, or they squat like girls. They, I don't know. Right. 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 So this is this really briefly. This is one of my. This is one of Kunahild's little state uh, 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 soapboxes. Is that in academia you publish or you perish? Right. Like that's the classic saying: publish or perish. So you have to have something new to talk about. Yep. So invariably you get some real weird interpretations because somebody needed a new angle with which to approach this particular poem. So yeah. in this case, yep. they were like, I know what somebody has never suggested before. 75 and 76 together mean P. They, they, <laughs> another one is hunting. Um, so the, the, mm. the, the, the woman sitting alone, maybe a hawk, uh, maybe a deer. Mm. Um, uh, so like you have the hound and the hawk or the hound and the, the, the doe. Sure, okay. What is it when they're apart? What's the woman's when they're two different? Um, so I think 76 largely doesn't have, if it's read alone, it doesn't have an answer because- Oh, it, that's it, why everyone's trying to- Yeah. Right. Because it's, it's just a single line, a woman sitting alone. Oh, <laughs> it's little Miss Muppet. There you go. Excellent. Yep. You should you should write that paper up and publish. Uh, you could get that published. <laughs> so the next one we're going to move on to is uh, Riddle sixty four, um, which I do have pulled up. Good. Ich seach win, uh, win und eis over over wang faren beram beork mon beam was on sitha habenindes. I have to keep looking up the, the runic names. Hagel und Ak Swulcha Thuradal Thorn on Man Yefeach. This one Yefeach Feoch und Ash Fleach over oh, grave soil. Ear Siegel und uh, Peorth Sophus das Focus. Um, so I saw, uh, I saw, oh, let's, let's show you guys the English one. I saw joy and ice cross the field bearing birch and bearing birch man, both felt happy in holding hail and oak 
joined forces to thorn and horse, cattle and ash rejoiced, flew over grave soil, question mark, sun, and we don't know how to translate this one, the people's own. So Peorth, really quickly, uh, Peorth is kind of fun because it shows up in the Anglo-Saxon rune poem um, and is, is defined as like the joy of the mead hall. But we don't know what the joy, of the, we don't know quite what it means. And it's unlike any other word in Old English. Mm -hmm. So we can't just sort of go, oh yeah, no, totally. This is this, is this thing. Um, and so the translation or the, this, the answer to this riddle is, uh, gets tricky. Um, and the I mean, right, just trying to riddle out what the runes mean within the riddle, right? Is <laughs> so here's the thing: is this is another case, probably. Uh, this one is is another one of those not quite settled answers, but probably a case of looking at the phonetic value of the runes, not the logographic value. So yeah. the the argument here is you start with um, uh, uh, win and ice, so w i uh, w i c g, which is a word for horse. Uh, then you have birch and man, um, which gets us uh, to uh, Bayorn, uh, which is a man, uh, H and A, that gets us to Hafuk, Hawk, uh, Thorn and E is Thane, a servant, F and Ash is uh, Falca, a falcon, A and A is water, uh, S and P gets us to Spera, a spear. So the answer you've got, um, a horse, a man, a hawk, a servant, a falcon, water, and a spear. Uh, so the answer that is often proposed is a hunter. A hunter, yeah. But that is a lot of... Yeah. That's a lot of work to get there. <laughs> yeah. It's, that's, yeah. Hmm. that's worse than Tungle Riorundum, Tungla. Yeah, it, it almost feels like it's intentionally obtuse. Yeah. Yeah. You know? I mean, not that riddles aren't... But always like, intentionally but, obtuse but, but like trying to this is like extra yeah extra right. obtuse mm -hmm. um but one of the things that's worth noting as as i think anybody watching this right now could could notice it is a lot easier to see these riddles um so this is an argument for poetry as something that's intended to be seen yeah. not something that is spoken aloud because as as you can know like as i'm reading it aloud suddenly it it, it doesn't make as it doesn't much. it doesn't make as much sense like you really have to see it to to see where the runes go in the the placement especially since runes can have they can either be standing in for just the letter or yeah. the actual words name or the or the, the concept room, yeah or the sound of the room yeah like it just so there's yeah how yeah how would how would you read it <laughs> right so this is the last one that I've pulled for us. Um, this is riddle uh, 19. It's on Sitha Seach, Sigil Rad Os Hagel, Huglonka, Helford Berchna, Swifna Ofer Salwong, Sweetha Thragen, Havda on him Rucha Hilda Hilda something. Um, Hilda Thrutha. Thrutha, yeah. Uh, need Os man, Naglinda rad, ak gufu ech huin, wildlas ferra runestrong on rada, rofna feoch, uh, sorry, uh, uh, runestrong on rada, rofna ken os feoch, os ak hagel. For was thy beorta swukra sit fat saga what ich hata. So the last bit is easy. Sa saga what ich hata say what I am called. I love it. I love it when old English uh, riddles end with say what I am called, or in this case, say my name. It's just, it's a nice yeah. little invitation. Because we know that that's the actual ending. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> So it, translating this, you could read it as journeying. I saw sun and writing and os could be read as God or mouth um, and hail, thought proud, head bright, swift over fertile plains, strong running, had on his back war strength, need, again, God or mouth, man, nailed rod. Uh, rod here, what's interesting is that rod here is spelled out, but it's the name of a rune, um, which is the, the, the R looking one. Mm -hmm. So that's that's rod. 
uh, oak and gift, horse, joy, wide wandering he bore, road strong and riding, uh, road strong and riding bold, torch, uh, got her mouth, cattle, got her mouth, oak, hail, his route was the richer, for such splendor say my name. So this one, aye, aye, aye. right? <laughs> okay, but uh, Ula kind of gave it away earlier. So if Sorry. you read the runes backwards, you have yeah. H-O-R-S, horse. So journeying, I saw a horse, thought proud, head bright, swift over fertile plains, strong running, hat on his back, M-O-N, that's man, nailed. And then Rad here uh, is the R rune. So then you have uh, W-E-G-A-R. Um, Wegar. Wegar, which I think is uh, a weapon again. Um, hang on. Uh, weapon of warrior. Uh, we got a war spear. Uh, so so he's he's carrying his war spear. Wide wandering, he bore road strong and riding bold. And then the last clue is H A O F O C, hawk, which is a hawk. Um, so wearing a hawk, his his route was the richer for such splendor. Say my name. It's a it's a hunter on horseback. This is this is the dead snake on the horse, dead horse on the ice floe moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Like it's it's a hawk on the arm of a warrior on a horse, and he's got a spear. Which really briefly, that is, if we think about um, Germanic iconography, the man on the horse with the spear, less the bird, but the 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 horse, the spear, the guy. That's a that's a pretty common motif. We see it in Frankish art. Um, in in pre-Christian Frankish art, we see it in German uh, in Scandinavian art, um, uh, it, both pre-Viking Age and Viking Age Scandinavian art, and we see it in uh, pre-Christian uh, English art. Uh, uh, a great example would be, if, if I remember correctly, the pressblech from the Sutton Hoo helmet. One of them is the man holding the spear on the horse. That's that's one of the the helmet plaques. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that may be a Vendel helmet plaque. It may be a Sutton Hoo helmet plaque. I'm a little iffy on that one. Um, Can't remember. But it's it's this it's it's this sort of iconography that that I think you see a lot of places. Um, I, it's a bummer that it's a little bit of a bummer that he's got a hawk on his arm, because if he didn't have the hawk on his arm, you could read into this a lot more. Like, is this a, an allusion to Odin? Mm -hmm. Is this like what's this this like the spear especially a spear is a very like that's odin is a spear god right like we yeah. talked about this when we talked about the creepy graves where there was that one grave with like all the spears stuck in it um you know like it's it's there's some really strong connections there um so uh but then you've got this hawk which the hawk kind of stands out right like it would have been a raven yeah right so yeah um, but anyway, so that's, that's this one. It's another one of these ones where you, you read the runes phonetically. You don't read them, uh, logographically or iconographically, iconographically. Um, this, yeah. This ahead. one would be like, I just, I like, you could just write one of these very easily in English by just like, but I'm imagining reciting this in English and having it be like the weirdest. Cause so to clarify, the the text here, the original in the original manuscripts, the uh, portion that is runes stands out because it is not a, they're using Latin script, right? Right. Right. Okay. So so I guess the only difference is that it would be kind of ridiculous to be reading it and then see just full like just horse spelled backwards like at yeah, the right. end. But you might be able to get away with it speaking is what I'm thinking, and by just spelling things backwards at the end of your line and just having it be confusing because like nothing you're saying makes any sense right and then if people are paying attention enough they can s take your letters backwards but uh. I, it, it feels to me a little bit like not saying the word walk when you're you know hey do you do you want to take the dog for a w-a-l-k like <laughs> yeah <laughs> I don't think that's quite a taboo deformation, but there's this whole thing in sociolinguistics, we talk about taboo def deformations. And what that would be is, uh, so a great example of this is um, the word for bear. So so using bear is a good example here. Right. Um, bear does not, it, it comes from brown, mm -hmm. right? Or the word in Russian, medved, uh, which means eater of honey, because you right. don't say the name of the animal 
because you don't want to call it upon you, right? right. So, so you call it the brown one, you call it the honey eater, you call it all these other things. Mm-hmm. Um, and so Katie, that's Hennings again. Uh-huh. It's like, yeah, yeah. but it's 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 because you want to avoid. You don't want to manifest that thing, right? So you don't want to get your dogs worked up. So you say we're going to go to the outside place, mm-hmm. right? Right. Yep. You know, exactly. Which I've My, absolutely uh, done with dogs. They, uh, my family, um, less with the dogs, but they uh, had this thing at a uh, large family gatherings, Christmas, Thanksgiving, whatever. Um, uh, when we were very young children, especially when my cousin, who's older than me, so this was a story recounted to me, was very young, they would spell out, you know, like dessert and ice cream and mm-hmm. cake. Um, and the, but the thing is they only ever spelled words out when it was right. dessert or ice cream or cake. And so my, my cousin Una um, apparently <laughs> one time very indignantly at like four years old was like, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> I may have done that also as a child. I didn't actually know, but I knew the concept of what right. was being like- talked about. Yeah, yeah. You know what? I I figured this out. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's roll into my favorite part. The obscene <laughs> ones. Speaking of taboo. Speaking um, of taboo, obscene. Taboo. Uh, there is this whole subgenre of riddles that that exists as a subgenre well into the Middle Ages. That oh, yeah. is the sexual riddle and uh this this article i found it's great article uh by mercedes salvador bello the sexual riddle type in albhelm's enigmata and exeter book and early medieval latin um i don't she identifies sort of these three types of sexual riddles the first type is a double entendre right your classic double entendre uh the second type is a direct or indirect reference to sex there's one great example where it, the poem or the the riddle just starts out i saw two creatures having sex you know, right. <laughs> like, oh, oh, okay, that's what we're talking about. Right, like, that's <laughs> where we're going. Um, and then the last one are these sort of body illusions. And uh, mm-hmm. and this is actually, she, I think she's the author who talks about 75 and 76 together as possibly a, uh, a reference to urine. Um, and and uh, so that's, that's, she groups 75 and 76 under this sort of body illusions moment, like, because things are peeing and I guess that's body. Um, but she identifies very few of this type of riddle, this, the third type in the Exeter book riddles. More what these are, are either, like there's a lot of these double entendres. So we read one already, which is the thing that hangs by a man's thigh and is looking for a special hole, right? Um, I'm sorry. Fine. Fine. <laughs> we, had, we had a whole like week on on these these types of riddles in my old English class, and I like we could none of us keep a straight face. Of course. Uh, so that's uh, that one, and then the direct and indirect references to sex is is slightly less frequent. Um, yeah. So to talk about some of these body riddles, right? Let's 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 read a couple. Um, I'm looking for 25. If you guys have a favorite, I've got. Uh, uh, I've got 45 up. It's a good one. Yeah, why don't you why don't you start with 45? All right. I have heard of something or other growing up in the corner, swelling and groaning, heaving up its covers. A mind proud woman, some prince's daughter, seized its boneless with it, seized it boneless with her hands, a tumescent thing covering it with her dress. Is is one translation. Another one is I've heard of something wax in the corner, like a waxing and waning of a moon. Swell and pop, lift up the covers. A proud-minded woman seized with her hands a boneless thing, a prince's daughter, covered with her dress the swelling thing. So it's clearly bread dough. Bread dough. It's and rising bread dough. So there, there's a, there's a sort of secondary joke in here in that. Um, the the words for like lord and lady the words that the the, the roots for our modern English words lord and lady are Hlaford uh, and Hlaftia and Hlaford uh, ultimately means uh, guardian of the bread and Hlaftia lady means uh, kneader of the bread yeah her of the dough and so, the Hlaf is a loaf yeah yep just, right yeah. Right. Uh, so she's she's the one who works the the loaf so here we're talking about this proud lady so you works know, the loaf. 
she works the, so clearly the answer that's the only logical answer to be read here is it just could be boneless but swelling under a cloth dress you you dirty minded people you um so one of my favorite oh sorry go ahead Bercy. oh i i just found i was just going to random ones from your list um so, <laughs> so you go ahead you do yours i've just got other one <laughs> So, so my personal favorite out of all of these is 25. Um, I'll read it in Old English, then I'll read it in Modern English. Full curtainu, churlestofter, mondlong meolo, meola, that heo on mech gripeth, raseth mech on reonda, rafath min heofid, fegeth mich on fastene, feleth sona minus yemotus, seo the mech nerwath, guif wundenlock, what bith that ega? Uh, so in, in, uh, in English, uh, modern English, I am a wondrous thing, a woman's delight, handy in the home. I harm no householder but him who harms me. My stock is tall, I stand in bed, my root rather hairy. The haughty girl, churl's gorgeous daughter, sometimes has the courage to clasp me, rushes my redness, rapes my head, stows me in her stronghold. Straight away, the curly locked lady who clamps me weeps at our wedding, wet is her eye. Um, yeah, we're back to alum yeah it's just onion. Another, onion. another onion it's another yep it's, yep i mean what else would it be right it's hairy at the base it's of course you you grasp it by the stock you right uh, right right normal totally fine totally it. normal and you know and and makes the the curly haired woman cry clearly an onion well, and what's, what's interesting, what with that eye, um, so it, it, this author translates that as wet is her eye, but that could also be read as uh, wet is that eye. Right. So, and I've seen, yeah, I, I, I've seen both, both translations. Hey, Bercy, uh, did you find a good one that you like? Yeah, I'm looking at 61 and 62, which are yep. both short. Can I do both of those? Yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah, so... Uh, 61, uh, often a noble woman, a lady locked me tightly in a coffer. Sometimes she drew me out with her own hands, giving me to her Lord, a loyal prince as she was ordered. Afterwards, he stuck his head into my breast, upwards from below, fixed in the narrowness. If courage avails the receiver, something hairy, I don't know what, must fulfill me, ornamented. Explain what I mean. <sighs> Uh, this one can refer to either maybe a shirt or a helmet. A shirt, sure. yep. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, I would say uh, uh, definitely, I think the imagery that most comes to mind, the, you know, putting the helmet or the shirt on from yep. underneath. You underneath as your, as your head pops through the narrow neckline. The narrow Absolutely. Opening. Yeah, you're tightly confined within. It makes perfect sense. Absolutely. Um, and the next, the next one's, even funnier to me because I think because the I this is so the next one is one that I, I had pulled out. I love this one. It kills me. The solution is already a double entendre. So uh -huh. we're, yeah. it's gonna be bad. All right. So it's riddle 62. I am a hard and pointed thing, sturdy in entering, bold at departing, well renowned from to my master, wallowing in the underbelly, clearing out the proper way for myself. A man is in a hurry who shoves me from behind, a hero dressed to the nines. Sometimes he tugs me too hot out of that hole. Sometimes I fare back into the nearness. I know not where. A southern man urges me urgently. Say what I am called. <laughs> and this, of course, clearing things out um being very helpful in your fireplace it's a poker it's a poker um, poking around and clearing out the I, ashes. I just want to know how a southern man uses a poker differently than a northern it's not man as, it's not as cold so maybe they use it less oh yeah, oh, yeah. Cool. of course of course 
yeah that was that's one of them that i had pulled out because that one cracked me up <laughs> so i think as folks can see from these riddles um there is quite the so when we think about the exeter book we think about the two the two episodes we've done so far, or this is the third episode so the two previous episodes on the exeter book it is like some really some of the highest points of of old english poetry right absolutely the wanderer the seafarer right these are just these are beautiful emotive poems beautiful so, poignant emotive poems and they and then there's the book. poker they share a book with i am hard and sharp strong to pierce a master slave right like like and they're all just randomly you know i mean the rills are kind of in blocks like everything's kind of in blocks but it's not like here's all the poignant love stories here's all of the descriptions of battle here are the clean riddles here no it's just all like somebody took a deck of cards threw them up in the air and that's what you get they're just they're everywhere and it's of course i you know immediately go to the raunchy ones because well and what's interesting i think uh, and worth thinking about is that if nothing else i think we get a little bit of a cultural education from these riddles um we know probably then that manscaping wasn't really important uh to the early Hair. medieval english like things are constantly very hairy down there or down wherever the you know so I would say that that continued all the way up to Shakespeare, at least since uh, I, I have some personal I, I played the wall once in Oh, uh, the wall is a very important character. Yes, I was the wall. Um, actually, I believe for Golden Beltane, um, the Golden Stag players did. I saw that. It was brilliant. Yeah. And um, or no, that wasn't Golden Beltane. No, it was a Twelfth Night. Twelfth, it was at twelfth. I think it was actually at twelfth night and Golden Beltane, and we just did a Golden Beltane first, and then did a twelfth night the same year. Anyway, yeah, point sense. is, I was the wall. I was also the lion, um, and the wall has some great lines about um, the hoary stones um, yep. and like the lime and hair caught between it or something like that. And yes, it seems that. Uh, hmm. <laughs> Well, I mean, it, because really, we're all still twelve. Like right. these these jokes. I have a, a book of it's basically limericks from ancient Greece, because everybody likes a dick joke. I, I mean, let's be real. I don't know. No, Maybe not right. everybody. Maybe it's not for everyone. <laughs> you're wrong. Well, we've gone for an hour and a half. Um, we have gone for an hour and a half, which is impressive because I didn't think we were gonna. You know, it's just riddles. How how hard can it be? it's just us having fun is what's happening right that is exactly what it is <laughs> uh so i appreciate you both uh putting up with my quick change last week where it's like yeah. i'm not gonna have time to talk no about no 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 this is I, me too oh, that's <laughs> brilliant love it um, so yeah. why don't you tell us because i'm gonna butcher the name why don't you tell us what we're talking about next week <laughs> yeah next week we're gonna talk uh we've done poetry sort of non-stop we're gonna do a little bit of prose um, so we're going to talk about the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, um, which is this really phenomenal uh, written history source, probably started in the reign of Alfred um, and continues into, in some, some versions of it, continue into the 12th century. So there's uh, records of the Battle of Hastings discussed. Um, and then what's really neat is within this, uh, within these various manuscripts, and there's, I think, A through G um, or A through F. Like there's, there's a number, like when we talk about those trees in Codicology and they descend from different places, right? So there's, there's at least A through F manuscripts that survive today. Um, uh, uh, brain, 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 brain. Uh, some of them contain poetry. Um, and so the, the poem that we're gonna talk about is the Battle of Brunaburg, uh, which is one of these where it's just a, an account of a battle that in other versions of the manuscript are just like a couple of lines. And then this one particular manuscript has the whole poem, this beautiful poem that describes the events of the Battle of Brunaburg. And the, it also contains other poems. There's a lot of poems about various kings' deaths. So just before the Battle of Hastings, they have the death of um, Edward and, and sort of there's a, a like, oh, he died. And then there's like this poem about his death, right? That kicks off, um, I think it's Edward the Confessor. Yes, Edward the yeah. Confessor. Um, so his death kicks off all this, stuff. anyway. That's what we're gonna talk about next week. I'm excited. It's the the Chronicles fun. 
it is it's le- yeah it's really just no it's gonna be it's gonna be great i'm looking forward to that because that's something else that's you know being more anglo-saxony i'm just not familiar with um and then march we're gonna start looking at luck so we all need to start thinking about luck in the norse and how luck is good or bad and there's so there's a lot of luck and we just have to like narrow that down so i think that's what we've got any other any parting words any last butt jokes i don't (laughs) oh wait there's another hang on hang on hang on hang on one last eusebulus riddle and then we can go oh yes please please there is an image which stands on top it's lower parts gaping board sharp board sharply clear through from head to foot it gives birth to men at the tail each one in turn and some of them obtain the right to live while others must wander forth each bearing his own fate in his person but calling out beware (laughs) it's going to be something super obvious but again i'm so bad at like parsing i don't know how obvious spoken word um uh because it does i mean like it's trying to it feels like it's trying to make me go in the maybe it's just because we've been talking about sex so much but i mean like there was definitely some like oh there were a couple of some phallic moments imagery, you might say <laughs> what's what what did you say i said some phallic imagery you might say yeah yeah yonic as well yeah, yeah well so it's penis it's a penis okay. it is a penis yeah. so things are really that okay all right <laughs> So that's, that's and there we have beware. it. Beware! It's <laughs> beware the penis. <laughs> <laughs> oh wait, no, wait, wait, one last one. I'm sorry. Okay, so wait, last one. No, I um, keep going. <laughs> this is this is a really this one kind of requires the joke. Uh, uh, requires some Latin knowledge. Uh, so it's it's litera que que culum facet ut uliat uliat ulet oculus, and then the gloss is et que culus. Ani dorsi que minime uidet uh, antipone o, o litera et uidibit ut oculus ut pote quia erat oculus. So I know, and I think I know enough Latin to, at the very least, we are. I, I did you say uh, there was one of the words in the in the uh, was it culus? Culus, yeah. Um, isn't so. Sorry, a cat just yelled out the door. Um, but, and there was a lot of about eyes. Yeah, about so eyes. I'm thinking once again, do we have some very clear Yonic uh, imagery here? Is this about a vagina or is this about something else? Am I just, is my Latin bad? How do you make an asshole C? Oh. <laughs> the answer is you add the letter O to transform coolus asshole into oh. oculus eye. oculus eye. Oh. oh no so that one's pseudo bead uh and it's a they, they describe it as a grammatical puzzle that takes a scatological turn um <laughs> you've got to love scholars because seriously that's <laughs> so okay i'm i'm done now i gotta go okay uh, we're so. gonna we're gonna <laughs> cut loose our poor audience who has suffered through an hour and a half of of butt and dick jokes <laughs> <laughs> you Welcome it. to it's Saga good. Saturday, your every time education for the day. <laughs> all right, we will see you all next week with the Battle of Brun, Bruna, 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 I keep wanting to say Bundaberg, like the soda from <laughs> Australia, which I love. I'll and make then. sure to get some before the episode. We'll just sit <laughs> All right, we will see everybody later. <laughs> Bye.